not easy. It's dangerous. It hasn't been done before. But these are the sorts of things that capture people's imaginations. Let's talk about the future of space exploration. John, come in. John, do you read me? Yeah, Grant, we read you loud and clear down here in Alabama. <laughs> awesome. So everybody, this is John Horak from Teledyne Technologies. So John, Teledyne's been involved with NASA doing projects since the 50s, since the original space race. Can you tell me a few of the projects that you've worked on? Well, you're right. Uh, we're based here in Huntsville, Alabama, which was the uh, home of the original Von Braun rocket team following, uh, following the war. And uh, they were the folks that launched America's first satellite into orbit and then uh, moved on to Apollo and eventually NASA built and flew the Skylab and the Space Shuttle. We've been involved with nearly every project since the beginning. And today we operate the payloads on board the International Space Station uh, and we're building hardware for NASA's new launch system called the SLS, uh, which will be the largest rocket ever flown. Now, space is probably one of the harshest environments I could imagine to send electronics into. What are some design considerations, some challenges that your engineers have in designing equipment that has to go into space? So when things go into space, uh, there's a couple things that are very, very important. Number one is you have to design it for an extremely hostile environment uh, compared to operations on Earth. It has to work in vacuum. It's got to work in the presence of radiation. It's got to work in the presence of extreme temperatures. All of these design constraints, uh, in some ways, apply to anything that flies in space, whether it's toothpaste for an astronaut or some highly sensitive electronics that you want to use for astrophysical purposes. But maybe more importantly than that, everything has to work together. So your thermal design, your electrical design, your mechanical design, uh, your ability to withstand radiation, all of that has to work together. So companies and other entities that fly things in space, they need to be technically very excellent, but also have a very, very strong systems engineering capability to put all of these things together so they work. Now, how do you test something that's going into space? Like, um, how do you generate vacuum or test for radiation, for example? So before anything flies in space, it undergoes a very, very serious level of rigorous testing. You will shake the item that you're sending into space to simulate the ride on a launch rocket to verify that it can withstand the acceleration of launch. You will put it into a thermal and a thermal vacuum chamber where you'll basically pump out all the air and then run the temperature up and down to verify that the uh, hardware can work in that kind of an environment. Uh, you, can, you put it into a test for electromagnetic interference, electromagnetic compatibility. But the ultimate test is when it flies and you, uh, you push the button and turn it on once it's, uh, once it's in space. Okay, let's talk rockets. I know that you've been involved with propulsion systems for a long time. Rocket science. What's the future of rockets? Well, I think I'd answer that question in two ways about what's the future of rocket propulsion. One of which you're actually seeing today, for example, um, the Dawn spacecraft, which NASA launched several years ago, uses a really, really cool ion propulsion system. It, uh, it first visited the minor planet Vesta and is now in orbit around Ceres. And these ion propulsion systems work really, really well once you're in space. They don't push very hard, but they push all the time. And so, in a way, you get very good gas mileage. Um, and because you're thrusting all the time, you can fly some very innovative trajectories that are different than what you might think a uh, traditional rocket, where you put all the thrust in in the beginning and then you coast, like in the case of New Horizons, all the way to Pluto. But in terms of launch from Earth, uh, over my right shoulder, you'll see this, the new space launch system that NASA is building. This will be the largest rocket ever to fly. Uh, it'll be flying by the end of this decade. Um, it'll launch several hundred thousand pounds into low Earth orbit. And uh, it'll be the rocket that carries people back beyond low Earth orbit and into the solar system. Okay, um, how's the design process different if you're designing a rocket versus say, a, a crew capsule to carry people? Well, some of the designs are, are different depending on what you want uh, the, uh, the device that you're flying in space to do. If you're building something to fly in space to carry people, the design process is incredibly rigorous. Uh, two and three and sometimes four fault tolerance uh, in terms of equipment failures. The inspection process, the ability to know where every single part in that rocket came from, 
Uh, it's an incredibly rigorous design and test process that requires not only excellence in a given discipline like thermal or electronics or mechanical design, but it's very, very important that also those experts know how to work across engineering uh, fields as well as things like human factors because you can't just put an astronaut, for example, in a crew capsule and not understand how the human interfaces with the, the hardware that you're building. Okay, let's talk human factors. Um, specifically ergonomic design. So you put a person in a capsule, what ergonomic considerations do you have for your equipment? Well, for example, switch, you may need to use a switch and it may be the case that the astronaut has to have a glove on when, when that switch is activated. And so, I mean, you can think about it if you've been skiing and you've got these big gloves on your hands and you're trying to fix your ski boots, Sometimes you take your gloves off because it's a, you, you're more dexterous if you, can, if you can use your fingers, but you can't do that outside a spacecraft. So you have to think about things like that. Um, when you're riding up the hill in the rocket, it's an incredibly vibrating environment. You're jostling all over the place. So if you need an astronaut to reach out and punch a button, that button better be pretty big because their hand may be bouncing all over the place trying to get to that, get to that particular button that, they, that, that, that you want them to press. Even sometimes reading output screens in the cockpit can be a challenge because of the vibration environment. Yeah, I would imagine that if it's a really important button, it's probably really big and probably red, maybe flashing. Yeah, it's big, it's red, it says only press if it's your last resort. Yeah, it's usually those kind. I don't, I, I don't think there are any big red buttons, for example, in the space shuttle, but, but yeah, that's a, way to, that's a way to think about it. If it's something important that the astronaut has got to get to, it's going to be accessible, it's going to be easy to identify, and it's going to be pretty, pretty straightforward for them to throw that switch. Now how about power? I know that in a lot of spacecraft, power is a big issue because you can't just you know, plug in. A lot of times you're, you're running on battery or you're collecting from solar. How big of an issue is your power system in your equipment? So until somebody uh, invents a very, very, very large extension cord, Power will always be a challenge in space. Um, for a spacecraft like the International Space Station, I mean, the solar panels on the space station cover a large percentage of a soccer field or a football field. So there's a lot of power on the ISS. But as spacecraft are smaller, or especially as you move further away from the sun, like in the direction of Mars or Jupiter or Saturn, power becomes very, very, uh, it becomes, it's a premium. And so you need to be innovative about how you generate power. And that's why, for example, Teledyne builds these large, essentially they're plutonium batteries. Um, they're the radioactive power generators on deep space uh, satellites that have gone uh, deep into the solar system and currently right now operating on the Curiosity rover on Mars. They're just places where you can't rely on sunlight because there's either not enough of it um, or you need to operate through the night or there's dust storms that could cover your solar panels. So you just have to be really innovative and, and very, very careful about how you collect and monitor power and use it in space. What projects are you excited about coming up for Teledyne, the ones that you can talk about? Yeah, okay, well I can, I can tell you one that I'm very excited about is uh, the opportunity that we have to build a platform for the International Space Station that will allow us to do unprecedented commercial Earth observations. Um, the ISS is one of the most amazing things you've ever seen. It literally, on many nights, is the brightest star in the sky, flying overhead at you know five miles a second. Um, and it's pretty amazing to think that engineers, scientists, technicians, financial folks, project managers, we're working on something that actually will add to the brightest star in the sky and give us the new and unique ability to take really, really nice and useful images of the Earth not just in terms of how, how finely resolved things are, so I can tell a car from a truck, but also to break that light into multiple colors and get unprecedented spectral resolution so we can learn about the physics and the biology and the chemistry of what we're looking at. All right, John, very important question here. Star Trek or Star Wars? Oh, clearly Star Trek for, for at least two reasons, one of which I happen to be talking up to you on the Enterprise, but. The second reason is when you look at when that show was put together um, and you consider the context of the United States and the world and our social dynamics at that time, Star Trek is an extremely forward-leaning, bold, and I think compelling view of how humanity can go into space and the reasons we do go to space today. So I hope that that's a, a little window into how 
our future will unfold as, as, as human beings launch into the solar system and hopefully eventually deeper into the galaxy. And not only that, I mean, thanks to the world of Star Trek, we have a lot of the inspiration for a lot of amazing things that we have today, like flip phones and tablets. Yeah, tr tremendous things. You see folks on the Enterprise carrying around little tablets that look like, uh, you know, the flat personal iPod or, or iPad or personal computer. Um, you know, they, they would store information in these little drives that they would put in and take out that look just like a, a little memory stick. Uh, a lot of things that uh, Gene Roddenberry, the, the creator of Star Trek, thought about, uh, we actually have those kinds of things today. Tricorder, for example, a device that can uh, read your insides from the outside. Now, it may be big and in, in the shape of an MRI machine, but, but we're, we're, a lot of those things have actually happened. That's right. Give it a few decades and it'll be about palm-sized. Yeah, that's, that's why we got to go back to work here, because we've we got to catch up with, those guys on, with you guys on the Enterprise. All right, John, thanks a lot for your time. We'd also like to thank our sponsors who helped make this episode possible. Microsemi, Vichay, and Phoenix Contact.